It's been quite a while since we last explored a dedicated footer concept here on the channel and while I was looking for inspiration for one recently, I came across this site which was featured as an honorable mention on awards back in 2023. Even though the site itself was released some time ago, it still holds up very well in terms of its design and animations. Out of all the animations on the page, one element stood out to me in particular, this parallax driven footer reveal at the very end of the scroll. As you reach the bottom of the page, the footer doesn't just appear, it slowly reveals itself with a subtle parallax motion as you scroll down. And to push the interaction a bit further, the footer also features a 3D model. As the section comes into view, the model animates in, and as you move your cursor, it responds with a soft ambient parallax motion that adds a lot of depth to it. We haven't covered anything quite like this on the channel yet, so it felt like a great candidate right away for a rebuild. So over the past week, I put together this scroll experience that mimics that same footer reveal, including the parallax driven entrance and a 3D model that reacts subtly to cursor movement just like the inspiration. In this video, I'll walk you through how to build this kind of interactive footer using HTML, CSS and JavaScript powered by GSAP scroll trigger for the scroll logic and 3JS for the 3D layer. If you find these kinds of rebuilds helpful, make sure you leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to access the source code for this project, along with hundreds of other similar micro projects and a brand new website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. Alright, let's jump into the code. Before we jump into the code, let's quickly go over the assets we'll be using for this project. For this demo, I'm working with a free 3D model that I found on Sketchfab. You can download it in the GLP format and place it directly inside your project folder. Later in the video, we'll load this model into the scene using 3JS and use it as the part of the footer interaction. And that's really it. There are no other assets required for this build. Alright, with that in place, let's start defining the HTML structure for this project. To keep things simple, we are only going to focus on the footer for this project. So first, I'll quickly add a few placeholder sections above it. I'll create three sections, give each one a unique class name and place a heading inside. This content isn't important at all. You can replace it with your actual site layout later. We just need enough scrollable space so we can reach the footer naturally. Now let's move on to the footer itself. I'll start by adding the footer element. This will act as the main wrapper for everything related to the footer experience. Inside the footer, the first thing I'll add is a div with the class footer container. This wrapper is a key part of the effect. We are going to animate this container later to create that parallax reveal instead of animating the footer directly. I'll explain why this approach works better once we get into the styling. Next, inside the container, I'll add a div with the id footer canvas. This is the space where we'll render our 3JS scene. Later on, we'll mount the WebGL renderer here and draw the 3D model behind the footer content. After that, I'll add another div with the class footer content. This will hold all of the visible footer content, text, links, labels, everything that sits on top of the 3D canvas. For the layout, we'll keep things straightforward and use a row-based structure. So inside the footer content, I'll add two divs with the class footer row. The first row will contain the main footer layout and the second row will be used for smaller supporting content near the bottom. Inside the first row, I'll add two divs with the class footer column. Then, inside the second column, I'll split things further by adding two sub-columns. This just helps organize related content and gives us a flexible layout to work with. At this point, the exact content doesn't matter. You could keep this very minimal if you want, but for this demo, I'll roughly mirror the structure of the inspiration so the layout feels realistic. Now, I'll go ahead and drop in some placeholder content. In the first column of the first row, I'll add a heading with some dummy copy. Then, inside both of the sub-columns, I'll add a few placeholder headings and links, just enough to visualize the layout. And finally, inside the second footer row, I'll add some small placeholder text to represent the footer metadata. That's all we need for the HTML. With this structure in place, we can move on to the styling and start shaping how this footer behaves visually. Alright, let's move on to the styling. First of all, I'll start by importing the fonts we'll be using for this project. I'm bringing in one font for the main headings and links and another one specifically for body text. This gives us a nice contrast between expressive headlines and more readable supporting copy. Next, I'll define a few color variables at the root level. These will act as our base palette for the entire layout including the sections above the footer and the footer itself. After that, I'll add a basic reset. I'll remove default margins and padding and make sure all elements use a predictable box model. 
then I'll hide the scroll bar. Since this is a motion focused demo, hiding it helps keep the experience visually clean and distraction free. Next, I'll set up the base typography. I'll apply the main font to the body so it becomes the default across the entire page. Then, I'll style the heading elements together. I'll keep their weight light and set a consistent line height so the typography feels calm and editorial rather than UI heavy. After that, I'll define the size scale for each heading level. This gives us a clear visual hierarchy between the large section titles, footer headings, and smaller labels while still allowing the text to scale naturally across different screen sizes. Next, I styled anchor elements. I've removed the default underline, applied the same lightweight feel as the headings, and made sure links it comfortably alongside the rest of the footer typography. Then, I've styled the paragraph text here. I've switched to the secondary font so it works well for smaller labels and supporting information. Now let's move on to the section styling. I'll make each section feel the viewport and center its content both vertically and horizontally. This isn't part of the footer effect itself. It simply gives us clean, full height sections to scroll through before reaching the footer. Then I'll give each section a different background and text color. This helps visually separate them and makes it easier to see the transition as we scroll down the page. Next, I'll start styling the footer. I'll position it relative and give it a fixed vertical presence along with a dark background and light text. I'll also hide any overflow here. This becomes important later when we start revealing the footer with motion. Now inside the footer, I'll style the footer container. This wrapper fills the entire footer and uses a flex layout to space the content vertically. Here is where the parallax logic begins. I'll initially shift this container upward so it starts slightly out of alignment. Later, using scroll-based animation, we'll gradually move this container back into its natural position. Instead of animating the footer itself, we animate this inner container which gives us a smoother, more controlled parallax reveal without affecting the document flow. I'll also add a performance in here since this element will be animated continuously as we scroll. Next, I'll style the canvas container. I'll position it to cover the entire footer area and place it behind the content layer. I'll disable pointer interactions so it doesn't interfere with the links and slightly soften it visually so it blends into the background. After that, I'll style the footer content wrapper. This wrapper sits above the canvas and uses a column layout to distribute content between the top and bottom of the footer. By keeping this layer separate, we can freely animate the background without affecting text readability. Next, I'll style each footer row. I lay them out horizontally and space their contents apart which gives us a clean top row for the main content and bottom row for secondary information. Then I will adjust the layout of the first row in more detail. I'll give the first column more visual weight and allow second column to hold multiple groups side by side. This creates a strong headline area balanced by more compact supporting content. Next, I'll style the sub-columns. I'll stack their content vertically and add some breathing room between items so the links and labels don't feel cramped. After that, I'll slightly constrain the width of the main heading in the footer. Finally, I'll add a small responsive adjustment on smaller screens. I'll stack the main footer layout vertically and allow the heading to expand naturally. This ensures the footer remains balanced and readable across different screen sizes. And that takes care of the CSS. Now that the layout and parallax foundation are in place, we can move on to the JavaScript and start firing up the scroll and 3D interactions. First, I'll import GSAP, then I'll import scroll trigger from GSAP since we'll use it to drive the footer reveal based on scroll position. Next, I'll import Lenis. Lenis is what we'll use to get that smooth scroll feeling and more importantly, it helps us keep scroll updates consistent when we connect it with scroll trigger. After that, I'll import 3JS. This gives us everything we need to create a 3D scene, set up a camera and render a model into the footer. And finally, I'll import GLTF loader. That loader specifically lets us bring in a 3D model file and place it inside our 3JS scene. Now that scroll trigger is available, I'll register it with GSAP. This step is required, otherwise GSAP won't recognize the plugin when we try to use it. Next, I'll wrap everything inside a DOM content loaded event. That way, none of this runs until the HTML has fully loaded and we know the footer elements we are selecting actually exist before we touch them. Now inside this callback, I'll start by setting up Lenis. Here, I'm going to paste a small block of code from the Lenis documentation. What this setup basically does is it connects Lenis and GSAP together so they stay in sync. First, I'll create a new Lenis instance. This activates smooth scrolling on the page. 
then I'll listen to Lenny scroll events and on every scroll update, I'll tell scroll ticker to update as well. Next, I'll hook Lenny's into GSAP's internal ticker. GSAP's ticker runs continuously, kind of like a lightweight animation loop. So on every tick, I'll call Lenny's animation frame method, which keeps the smooth scrolling running consistently. And then I'll disable GSAP's lag smoothing. This just makes the animation timing more direct and responsive, especially when you are mixing scroll-based animation with a custom scroll engine like Lenny's. Alright, once the scroll system is set up, I'll grab a reference to the footer container. This is the same element we initially shifted up for in CSS. We are going to animate this container based on scroll to create the parallax reveal effect. So let's actually add that parallax logic. I'll create a new scroll trigger instance and attach it to the footer. I'll configure it so the animation starts when the footer enters the viewport from the bottom and finishes right as the footer fully reaches the bottom of the page. I'll also enable scrubbing which means the animation progress is directly tied to the scroll position. There are no timelines or delays here just pure scroll driven motion. Inside the on update callback, I'll read the current scroll progress. This gives us a value that moves smoothly from the start of the trigger to the end. Using that progress, I'll calculate how far the footer container should move vertically. At the beginning of the scroll, the container stays offset and as we scroll down, it gradually moves back into its natural position. Instead of animating the footer itself, we are animating this inner container. This gives us a much cleaner parallax effect because the footer stays in place in the document flow while the content inside it appears to slide into view and that's it for the parallax setup. At this point, we already have a working footer reveal that responds directly to scroll. Next, we start layering interactivity beginning with mouse tracking and then moving into 3JS scene inside the footer. First, I'll create a simple object to store mouse position. I'll give it two properties, one for the horizontal axis and one for the vertical axis. We are going to update these values continuously as the user moves their cursor. Next, I'll listen for mouse movement on the window. Every time the mouse moves, I'll capture its position on the screen. Instead of storing raw screen coordinates, I'll normalize these values. This step is important. By normalizing the mouse position, we convert it into a consistent range that behaves the same on all screen sizes. I'll also invert the vertical value. This just aligns the direction of movement with how we typically expect objects to respond in 3D space. Moving the mouse up feels like the object tilts upward and vice versa. At this point, we are not animating anything yet. We are simply collecting input and preparing it so we can use it later. Now we can move on to setting up the 3JS scene. First, I'll grab the footer canvas element. This is the container we defined earlier in the HTML. Everything related to 3JS will live inside this element. Next, I'll create a new 3JS scene. You can think of this scene as a virtual 3D room. Every object we add, lights, cameras, models, exists inside this space. After that, I'll create a perspective camera. A perspective camera mimics how we see things in real life. Objects farther away appear smaller and objects closer appear larger. That's why it works well for subtle, realistic 3D effects like this one. I'll also base the camera's proportions on the size of the footer canvas. This ensures the scene doesn't stretch or distort. Then I'll position the camera slightly in front of where the model will sit. This gives us a natural viewing distance without feeling too dramatic or zoomed in. Next, I'll create the renderer. The renderer's job is to take everything in the scene and draw it onto a canvas element. I'll enable transparency so the background stays transparent and blends nicely with the footer behind it. I'll also enable smoothing so the edges of the model look clean and polished. Then, I'll size the renderer to match the footer canvas. This ensures the 3D scene always fits perfectly inside the footer. I will also adjust it for high density screens so it looks sharp on modern displays. Once that's done, I'll append the render's canvas element into the footer canvas container. At this point, the 3 js setup is complete, but the scene is still empty. Now, I'll add lighting. Without light, a 3D model would appear completely flat or invisible. I'll add a directional light which simulates light coming from a specific direction, similar to sunlight. I'll position it slightly off to the side and above the model. This helps define the shape and depth of the object without making it look harsh or overly dramatic. Then I'll add the light to the scene. Next, I'll prepare the model loader. I'll create a new instance of the GLTF loader which allows us to load a 3D model file. I'll also define a few variables up front. One variable will store the model once it's loaded. The other two variables will store base values for the model's rotation and depth. These base values are important. They represent the model's default state before we apply any mouse interaction. Later, we'll modify these values using scroll and then layer mouse movement on top. Now I'll load the model file. Once the model finishes loading, I'll grab the scene object from the file and store it. Next, I'll calculate a bounding box around the model. This gives us information about the model size and center point. 
This step is crucial. Different models are authored differently and their pivot points aren't always centered. If we don't fix this, rotations can feel awkward and unbalanced. So I'll subtract the center point from the model's position which effectively centers it in the scene. After that, I'll set an initial position and rotation. This gives the model a slightly angled starting pose which feels more natural than a perfectly flat orientation. Next, I'll normalize the model scale. I'll scale it based on its largest dimension so it fits comfortably within the scene. Once everything is aligned, I'll add the model to the scene. Now let's connect the model back to scroll. Earlier, inside the scroll trigger on a bit callback, I'll add two more lines. First, I'll add the model's base depth based on the scroll progress. At the beginning of the scroll, the model sits slightly farther back. As the footer reveals itself, the model slowly moves forward. This creates a subtle feeling that the model is arriving along with the footer content. Next, I'll update the model's base rotation on the horizontal axis. At the start, the model has a slight tilt, and as you scroll down, the tilt gradually relaxes. These values don't animate the model directly, instead, they define a base state that changes with scroll. Later, inside the animation loop, we'll smoothly blend mouse movement on top of this base state. So the scroll controls where the model lives in space and the mouse controls how it gently reacts to the user. Now that everything is set up, the scroll logic, the mouse input and the 3D scene, we can finally bring it all together. This is where we actually animate the model and render the scene. First, I'll create a function called animate. This function is going to run continuously frame by frame and it's what allows the model to respond smoothly to both scroll and mouse movement. Inside this function, the first thing I'll do is request the next animation frame. This tells the browser to call this function again before the next screen refresh. By doing this recursively, we create a continuous animation loop. Now, before we apply any transformations, I'll check if the model has finished loading. This is important because the model is loaded asynchronously. So everything inside this block only runs once the model is available. Next, I'll calculate the target rotation values for the model. First, I'll use the mouse's horizontal position to determine how much the model should rotate on the vertical axis. This gives us that subtle left to right parallax effect as the cursor moves across the screen. Then I'll calculate the vertical rotation. Here, I'll combine two things, the mouse's vertical position and the base rotation value that we previously set using scroll. This is an important idea. Scroll defines the model space pose and mouse movement adds layer of interaction on top of it. So instead of fighting each other, scroll and mouse work together. Now, instead of snapping the model directly to these target values, I'll interpolate toward them. This is a key detail. Rather than setting the rotation instantly, I'll slowly move the model's current rotation toward the target rotation. This creates inertia. The model feels like it has weight. It gently follows the cursor instead of snapping rigidly into place. I'll apply the same smoothing logic to the model's position along the depth axis as scroll updates the base depth. The model gradually moves forward or backward instead of jumping. This smoothing is what makes the interaction feel polished and natural. Once the model transformations are updated, I'll render the scene. Rendering means taking everything in the scene, the camera, the lights, and the model, and drawing it onto the canvas. This happens every frame, which is why the model feels alive and responsive. After defining the animation loop, I'll call the function once to start it. From this point on, the loop keeps running automatically. Finally, I'll handle resizing. I'll listen for window resize events. Whenever the viewport changes size, I'll update the camera's aspect ratio so the scene doesn't stretch or distort. Then I'll update the camera's projection metrics to apply that change. And lastly, I'll resize the renderer so the canvas continues to match the size of the footer container. This ensures the 3D scene stays sharp, correctly scaled, and visually consistent across all screen sizes. And that completes the entire setup. That's the full system working together as one cohesive interaction. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.